Thank you for joining me for another UnleashingFreedom.com podcast. This is Richard Wells. Way back in 1735, Andrew Hamilton, a famous lawyer in the American colonies, argued a landmark case which helped establish freedom of the press in America. Now, in his defense of the printer Peter Zanger, he stated, The loss of liberty to a generous mind is worse than death. The man who loves his country prefers its liberty to all other considerations, well knowing that without liberty, life is misery. You'd be hard-pressed to find a fellow countryman who wouldn't agree that a life without liberty is misery. However, to find one who completely agrees with Hamilton's quote in both word and deed is another matter altogether. And just what do I mean? Well, rather than answer the question directly, let's consider a couple of examples, one of them actual and the other one allegorical. In his book, Farmers at the Crossroads, former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Ezra Benson describes the effects of government legislation which attempted to control prices of agricultural products by controlling farming practices. Now, the policy required that in exchange for government payment, farmers would agree to reduce the amount of acreage used to plant the so-called basic crops. For example, Uh, During the program, farmers were paid to take 30-plus million acres of wheat fields out of production. The idea was that by reducing the supply of wheat, the price would be held high. In actuality, farmers planted different crops like feed grain on this acreage, and then with the subsidy money, they bought better equipment and fertilizer, which increased yield on the remaining land that they did use for the wheat production. Now, the massive increase in feed grain production ended up driving the price of meat products down. To try to rectify this, the government then bought large quantities of overproduced products, which encouraged more people to invest in farming. These non-farmers then clamored for government support because of the inefficiency of their operations. Now, to complicate matters more, the higher prices actually drove down exports as foreign producers began to be more competitive around the world. With cotton alone, these policies reduced its exports from 7 million bales of cotton per year to only 2 million in 1955. As Secretary of Agriculture, Benson often pleaded with the farming community to not accept the enticing subsidies offered by government. He contended that the only way to maintain freedom and liberty was to have a principle-based, self-disciplined, independent-minded people. Anything less would ultimately lead to having our lives controlled. The following illustration he offers is almost humorous if it didn't strike so close to home. Quote, We cannot maintain freedom and be like the young man who lived with his parents in a public housing development, rode the free school bus, and participated in the free school lunch program. He obtained his degree at the state university, working part-time in the state capital to supplement his GI education check. Upon graduation, he married a public health nurse and obtained an RDFC loan to go into business. He then bought a ranch with an FHA loan and obtained emergency feed from the government. He later put part of his land in the soil bank, which we just referred to, and the payments soon took care of the loan on his ranch. The government helped to clear his land, and the county agent showed him how to terrace it. Then the government built him a fish pond and stocked it with many fish, The government guaranteed him a sale for his farm products at the highest prices. His children grew up, entered public schools, ate free lunches, rode free school buses, and swam in the public pools. He signed a petition seeking federal assistance in developing a doubtful industrial project to help the economy of his area. He was the leader in obtaining the new federal building, and he went to Washington with the group to ask the government to build a great dam costing millions so that his community could get the benefit of a temporary payroll. He petitioned the government to give the local air base to the county. He was also a leader in the movement to get special tax write-offs and exemptions for his specific type of farming. Then one day, after he calculated his taxes, he wrote his congressman, I wish to protest the excessive government expenditures and attendant high taxes. I believe in rugged individualism. I think people should stand on their own two feet without accepting handouts. I am opposed to all socialistic trends, and I demand a return to the principles of our Constitution and the policies of states' rights. Now, is this a bit extreme? Perhaps. But every day we hear people clamor for more government help, support, tax credits, and holidays, 
while expressing absolute derision of the bailouts, grants, and political agendas that are burning up our public treasury. Can we see the hypocrisy? At the end of the day, personal responsibility demands that we accept the consequences of our behavior. Individuals must accept it personally if our convictions have any chance of influencing Washington. Think about it. Every time we blame someone else for our lack of success, we must accept the fact that our liberty is now in the hands of that person or thing to which we are assigning the blame. Now, in light of this, reflect again on Andrew Hamilton's words. Quote, The man who loves his country prefers its liberty to all other considerations, well knowing that without liberty, life is misery. From your accepting personal responsibility to sounding that same call in the vast array of communities you serve, your example first and foremost will drive misery away and usher liberty in. Thank you for joining us on this podcast today. Please visit unleashingfreedom.com for personal applications and hear more podcasts about the success principles that unleashed unprecedented freedom in America.